Chapter One of Storky and Co. More Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. Storky and Co. More Stories by Rudyard Kipling. Chapter One. Storky. How they have taken Kinmont Willie against the peace of the border tide, and they forgot that the bold Buchluch was keeper here on the Scottish side. Kinmont Willie. And then Davitri said they were beastly funks not to help, and I said they were too many chaps in it to suit us. Besides, there's bound to be a mess somewhere or other with old Davitri in charge. Wasn't I right? Quite. And anyhow, it's a silly business I bung through. What'll they do with the beastly cows when they've got them? You can milk a cow if she'll stand still. That's all right. You're a pig, Beetle. No, I ain't. But what's the sense of driving a lot of cows up from the burrows? To, to, where is it? There, trying to drive them to, to his barnyard at the top of the hill. The empty one, where we smoked last Tuesday. It's a revenge. Vidley chivied De Vitre twice last week for riding his ponies on the burrows, and De Vitre is going to lift as many of old Vidley's cattle as he can and plant them up the hill. He'll muck it, though, with Parsons, Orin, and Howlett helping. They'll only yell and shout and bunk if they see Vidley. We might have managed it, said McTurk, slowly, turning up his coat collar against the rain that swept over the burrows. His hair was of the dark mahogany red that goes with a certain temperament. We should, Corcoran replied with equal confidence, but they've gone into it as if it was a sort of spridger hunt. I've never done any cattle lifting, but it seems to me that I might just as well be stalky about a thing as not. Smoking vapours of the Atlantic drove low in pearly grey wreaths above the boys' heads. Out of the mist to windward, beyond the grey loom of the pebble ridge, came an unceasing roar of the sea, rising and falling in mile-long rollers. To leeward, a few stray ponies and cattle, the property of northern potwallopers, and the playthings of the boys in their leisure hours, showed through the haze. Beyond blotted out lay Appledore and the flats of her pool, where the Tor and the Torridge join. They halted by the cattle gate, which marks the limit of cultivation, where Northam Hill comes down to the burrows. Beetle, shock haired and bespectacled, drew his nose pensively to and fro along the wet top bar. McTurk shifted from one foot to the other, watching the water drain into either print, while Corcoran whistled through his teeth as he leaned against the sod bank, peering into the mist. A grown or sane person might have called the weather vile, but the boys of the college had not yet learned the national interest in climate. It was a little damp, to be sure, but it was always damp in Easter term. And, this was an article of faith, sea wet could not give one a cold under any circumstances. Mackintoshes were excellent things to go to church in, but crippling if one had to run at short notice across heavy country. So they waited serenely in the downpour, clad as their mothers would not have cared to see. "'Oi say,' said Beetle, wiping his spectacles for the twentieth time, "'if we weren't going to help De Vitre, what are we here for? We're going to watch, of course. I wish to goodness they'd hurry up.' "'It's an awful business, driving cattle in the open country,' said McTurk, who, as the son of an Irish baronet, knew something of these operations. "'They'll have to run half over the burrows after them. Suppose they're riding Vidley's ponies? Dimitri sure to be. He's a dab on a horse. Listen, what a filthy row they're making. They'll be heard for miles. The thick air filled with whoops and shouts, cries, words of command, the rattle of broken golf clubs, and the clatter of hooves. Three cows, with their calves, came up to the cattle gate, at an indignant milch canter, followed by four heifers and some bullocks. A fat and freckled youth of fifteen trotted behind them, 
riding barebacked and brandishing a hedge stake. De Vitre, up to a certain point, was an inventive youth, with a passion for horse exercise that the northern commoners did not encourage. Farmer Vidley had once called him a thief, for the small matter of chasing cows across the burrows, and the insult rankled. Hence the raid. "'Come on!' he cried over his shoulder. "'Open the gate, Corcoran, or they'll all cut back again. We've had no end of bother to get them. Oh, won't old Vidley be wild!' Three boys in foot ran up, shooing the cattle in excited amateur fashion, till they headed into the narrow high-banked Devonshire lane that led up the hill. "'Come on, Corcoran, it's no end of a lark!' pleaded De Vitre, but Corcoran shook his head. The raid had been presented to him after dinner that day, as a completed scheme, in which he might, by favour, play a minor part, and Arthur Lane Corcoran, number 104, did not care for lieutenancies. "'You'll be collared,' he cried, as he shut the gate. "'Parsons and Orrin are no good in a row. You'll be collared for sure as a gun, De Vitre. "'Oh, you're a beastly funk!' The speaker was already hidden by the mist. "'Hang it all,' said McTurk. "'It's about the first time we've ever had a cattle lift at the coll. Let's not march. Keep your eye on Uncle,' said Corcoran firmly. His word was law in matters like these. Experience had taught them that, if they manoeuvred without Corcoran, they fell into trouble. "'You're jealous because you didn't think of it first, said Beetle, and Corcoran kicked him three times, slowly neither he nor Beetle changing a muscle the while. No, I ain't, but it isn't Storky enough for me. Storky, in the school vocabulary, meant clever, well considered and wily. As applied to a plan of action, and stalkiness was the one virtue Corcoran toiled after. Same thing, said McTurk. You think you're the only Storky chap in the coal. Corcoran kicked him as he had kicked Beetle, and even as Beetle and McTurk took not the faintest notice. By the etiquette of their three-year-old friendship, this was no more than formal notice of dissent from a proposition. They haven't thrown out any pickets. Not for nothing did the school prepare boys for Sandhurst. They ought to do that, even for apples. To his barnyard may be full of people, for all they know. "'Twasn't last week,' said Beetle, "'when we smoked in that cart-shed place. It's a mile from the house, too.' Up went one of Corcoran's light eyebrows. "'Oh, Beetle, I am so tired of kicking you. "'Does that mean it's empty now? "'They ought to have sent one fellow ahead to look. "'They're simply bound to be collared. "'And where'll they bunk to, if they have to run for it? "'Parsons has only been here two terms. "'He don't know the lie of the country. "'Orrin's a fat ass, "'And Howlett bunks from a governor. A "'Vernacular for a native of Devon.' engaged in agricultural pursuits. As far as he can see one. De Vitre is the only decent chap in the lot, and, and I put him up to try and to his farmyard. Well, keep your hair on, said Beetle. What are we going to do? It's rather damp here. Let's think a bit. Corcoran whistled between his teeth, and presently broke into a swift, short, double shuffle. We'll go straight up and see what happens to him. Cut across the fields, and lie up in the hedge where the lane comes in by the barn, where we found the dead hedgehog last term. Come on! He scrambled over the earth bank and dropped into the rain soaked plough. It was a stiff rise to the brow of the hill where to his outbound stood. The boys took no account of stiles or footpaths, crossing field after field diagonally, and where they found a hedge bursting through it like beagles. The lane lay on their right flank, and they heard much lowing and shouting from that direction. "'Well, if he isn't collared,' said McTurk, kicking off a few pounds of loam against the gate-post, "'he jolly well ought to be.' "'We'll be collared, too, if you go with your nose up like that. Duck, you ass, and come along under the hedge.' "'We can get quite close up to the barn,' said Corcoran. "'There's no sense in not doing a thing stalkily while you're about it.' They wriggled into the top of an old hollow double hedge, less than thirty yards from the big black-timbered barn and the square outbuildings. Their ten minutes' uphill climb had lifted them a couple of hundred feet above the burrows. As the mists parted here and there, 
they could see the great triangle of sodden green, tipped with yellow sand dunes and fringed with half a mile of white foam, laid out like a blurred map below. The steady thunder of the surge along the pebble ridge made the background to the wild noises in the lane. What did I tell you? said Corcoran, peering through the dripping stems of quickset, which commanded a view of the farmyard. Three farm chaps getting out dung with pitchforks. It's too late to head off to Vitre. We'd be collared if we showed up. Besides, they've heard em. They couldn't help hearing. What asses! The natives, brandishing their weapons, talked together, using many times the word colleger. As the tumult swelled, they disappeared into various pens and byres. The first of the cattle trotted up to the yard gate, and De Vitre felicitated his band. "'That's all right!' he shouted. "'Oh, won't old Vidley be wild! Open the gate! Open the gate, Orin, and whack em through! They're pretty warm!' "'So will you be in a minute,' muttered McTurk. The raiders hurried into the yard behind the cattle. They heard a shout of triumph, shrill yells of despair saw one Devonian guiding the gate with a pitchfork, while the others, alas, captured all four boys. "'Of all the infernal, idiotic, lower-second asses,' said Corcoran, "'they haven't even taken off their house-caps.' "'Oi, you young rascals! We've got ee! "'What we doin' to Master Fidley's bullocks?' a man cried. "'Oh, we found them,' said the Vitre, who bore himself well in defeat. "'Would you like em? Found un?' They bullocks drove like that, all heavin' and pinkin' and, and hotted. Oh, tis shameful! You night a killed the cows, let alone stealin' em. They sends poor boys to jail for half of this. That's a lie, said Beetle to McTurk, lying in the wet grass. I know, but they always said. Remember when they collared us at the monkey farm that Sunday, with the apples in your topper? My aunt, they're going to lock em up and send for Vidley, Corcoran whispered, as one of the captors hurried downhill in the direction of Appledore, and the prisoners were led into the barn. But they haven't taken their names and numbers, said Storky, who had fallen into the hands of the enemy more than once. But they're bottled tight, oh, rather sickly for de Vitre said Beetle. It's one lickin' anyhow, even if Vidley don't hammer him. The head's pretty wild about gate-liftin', and poaching and that sort of thing. He won't care for cattle-stealin' much. It's awfully bad for cows, too, to run em about in milk, said McTurk, lifting one knee from a sodden primrose tuft. What's the next move, Corky? Let's get into the old cart-shed, where we smoked last Tuesday. It's next to the barn. We can cut across while they're inside, and get in through the window. Suppose we are collared, said Beetle, cramming his red and black house cap into his pocket. One does not attack under house colours. That's just it. They'd never dream of any more chaps walking bung into the trap. Besides, we can get through the roof if they spot us. Keep your eye on Uncle. Come on. A swift dash carried them to a huge clump of nettles beneath the unglazed back window of the cart shed. Its open front, of course, gave on to the barnyard. They scrambled through, dropped among the carts, and climbed up to a rudely boarded upper floor that they had discovered a week ago when in search of retirement. It covered half of the building, and ended in darkness at the barn wall. The roof tiles were broken and displaced. Through the chinks they commanded a clear view of the yard, half filled with disconsolate cattle, steaming sadly in the rain. You see? said Corcoran, ever careful to secure an open line of retreat. If they bottle us up in here, we'll squeeze out between these rafters, slide down the roof, and bunk. Thru they couldn't even get out through the window. They'd have to run right round the barn. Now are you satisfied, you burbler? Huh. You only said that to make quite sure yourself, Beetle retorted. If the boards went on loose, I swear I'd kick you, growled Corcoran. What's the sense of getting into a place if you can't get out of it? Shut up and listen. A confused murmur of voices reached them from the end of the attic. McTurk tiptoed thither with caution. Hoy, it leads through. At least you can get through. Come along. He fingered the boarded wall. What's the other side? said Corcoran, cautious. Hey, you idiot! 
they heard his boot heels grating on wood and he was gone at some time or other sheep must have been folded in the cart shed and an inventive farmhand sooner than take the hay round had displaced a board in the barn side and thrust fodder through it was in no sense a lawful path but twelve inches square is all that any boy needs look said beetle as they waited mcturk's return the beastly cattle are coming in out of the wet a brown hairy back showed some three feet below the half floor as one by one the cattle shouldered in for shelter among the carts filling the shed with their sweet breath that blocks our way out unless we get out by the roof and that's rather too much of a drop unless we have to said corcoran they're all bung in front of the window what a day we're having corcoran beetle mcturk's whisper shook with delight can you see em i've seen em they're in a blue funk in the barn and the two clods are making fun of em horrid orin's trying to bribe em and parson's nearly blubbing come and look i'm in the hayloft get through the hole don't make a row beetle lithely they wriggled between the displaced boards into the hay and crawled to the edge of the loft three years of skirmishing against a hard and unsympathetic peasantry had taught them the elements of strategy for tactics they looked to cochran but even beetle notoriously absent-minded held a lock of hay before his head as they crept forward there was no haste no betraying giggle no squeak of excitement they had learned by stripes the unwisdom of these things but the conference by a root cutter on the barn floor was deep in its own affairs de vitre's party promising entreating and cajoling while the natives laughed wait till muster vidley and muster towie yes and the policeman come was the only answer tis about time to go milkin what'll us do abram you go to milk tom and i'll stay along of the young gentleman said the bigger of the two captors mr towie he's like to charge you for using his yard so free is fie you'll be what proper reckon you'll be asking for junkets to set in this week o sundays to come but mr vidley he'll give ee the best latherin of all im passionful i tell ee tom stumped out to milk the barn doors closed behind him and in the fading light a great gloom fell on all but abraham who discoursed eloquently on mr vidley his temper and attributes Corcoran turned in the hay, and retreated to the attic, followed by his army. No good, was his verdict. I'm afraid it's all up with them. We'd better get out. Yes, but look at these beastly cows, said McTurk, spitting onto a heifer's back. It'll take us a week to shove them away from the window, and that brute Tom'll hear us. He's just across the yard milkin'. Tweak em, then, said Corcoran. Hang it! I'm sorry to have to go, though. If we could get that other beast out of the barn for a minute, we might make a rescue. Well, it's no good. He drew forth a long, lean, well-worn homemade catapult, the tweaker of those days, slipped a buckshot into a supple chamois leather pouch, and pulled to the full stretch of the elastic. The others followed his example. They only wished to get the kettle out of the way, but seeing the back so near, they deemed it their duty each to choose his bird and let fly with all their strength. But they were not in the least prepared for what followed. Three bullocks, smitten as they believed by Io's gadfly, trying to wheel amid six close-pressed companions, not to mention three calves, several carts, and all the lumber of a general utility shed, cannot turn end for end without confusion. It was lucky for the boys that they stood a little back on the floor, because one horned head tossed in pain flung up a loose board at the edge, and it came back down lancewise on amazed backs. Another victim floundered bodily across the shafts of a decrepit gig, smashing these and oversetting the wheels. That was more than enough for the nerves of the assembly. With wild bellowings and buttings they dashed into the barnyard, and began a very fine free fight on the midden. The last cow out hooked down an old set of harness, which flipped over one eye and trailed behind her. When a companion trod on it, which happened every few seconds, she naturally fell to her knees, 
and, being a burrow's cow, with the interests of her calf at heart, attacked the first passer-by. Half awed, but wholly delighted, the boys watched the outburst. It was in full flower before they even dreamed of a second shot. Tom came out of the byre with a pitchfork, to be chased in again by the harness cow. A bullock floundered on the muck heap, fell, rose, and bedded himself to the belly, helpless a stare and bellowing. The others took great interest in him. Corcoran, through the roof, scientifically tweaked a frisky heifer on the nose, and it is no exaggeration to say that she danced on her hind legs for half a minute. Abram, oh Abram, they'm bewitched, they'm raging. Tis the milk fever. They'll be drove mad. Oh Abram, they'll harm the bullocks. They'll harm me, Abram. Bye till I lock the door," quoth Abram, faithful to his trust. They heard him padlock the barn door. Saw him come out with yet another pitchfork. A bullock lowered his head. Abraham ran to the nearest pig pen, where unearthly squeakings told that he had disturbed the peace of a large family. Beetle, snapped Cochrane, go in and get em up here, quick. We'll keep the cows happy. A people sitting in darkness, and the shadow of a monumental licking, too depressed to be angry with De Vitre, heard a voice from on high saying, Come up here. Come on. Come on, come up. There's a way out. They shinned up the loft stanchions without a word, found a boot heel which they were bidden to take for guide, and squeezed desperately through a hole in darkness, to be hauled out by Cochrane. You got your caps? Did you give me your names and numbers? said he. Yes, no. That's all right. Drop down here. Don't stop to jaw. Over the cart. Through that window and bunk. Get out! De Vitre needed no second word. They heard him squeak as he dropped among the nettles, and through the roof chinks they watched four slight figures disappear into the rain. Tom and Abraham from Byre and Pigpen exhorted the cattle to keep quiet. By gum, said Beetle, that was stalky. How did you think of it? You ass, it was the only thing to do. Anybody could have seen that. Hadn't we better bunk too? said McTurk uneasily. Why, we'll be all right. We haven't done anything, have we? I want to hear what old Vidley Hat will say. Stop tweaking, Turkey. Let him cool off. Golly, how that heifer danced! I swear I didn't know cows could be so lively. We are only just in time. My hat, here's Vidley and Tui," said Beetle, as two farmers, both with sticks, strode into the yard. Gloats, oh gloats! Fids, oh fids! Hefty fids and gloats to us," said Corcoran. These words, in their vocabulary, expressed the extreme of delight. Gloats implies, more or less, of personal triumph. Fids is felicity, in the abstract. And the boys were tasting both that day. Last joy of all, they had the pleasure of Mr. Vidley's acquaintance, albeit they did not love them. Tui was more of a stranger, his orchards lying over near the public road. Tom and Abraham together told a tale of stolen cattle, maddened by overdriving, of cows sure to die in calving, and of milk that would never return. That made Mr. Vidley swear for three consecutive minutes, in the soft speech of North Devon. "'Tis too bad! Tis too bad!' said Tui consolingly. "'Let's hope they haven't took no great harm. They be wonderful wild, though. "'Tis all well for you, Tui, that sells them dumb colleges seventy quarter a week. Eighty, Tui replied with the meek triumph of one who has underbidden his neighbour on tender. But that's no odds to me. You am free to lather em same as if they was your own sons. On my barn floor shall he lather em. Generous old pig, said Beetle. De Vitre ought to have stayed for this. They'm all safe and to rights, said the officious Abraham, producing the key. Reckon us'll come in and hold em for you. Hey! The cows are fair raging still. Us left to run for it. The barn being next to the shed, the boys could not see that stately entry, but they heard. Gone and hide it up in the hay. Oi, they ain't proper afraid. Routin out, routin out! Thundered Vidley, rattling a stick impatiently on the root cutter. Oh my aunt! Said McTurk, standing on one foot. Shut the door! Shut the door! 
I tell ye, reckon us can find un in the dark. Us don't want un boltin like rabbits is under our elbows. The big barn door closed with a clang. My hat, said Corcoran, which was always his oath in time of action. He dropped down and was gone for perhaps ten seconds. And that's all right, he said, returning at a gentle pace. What? McTurk almost shrieked, for Cochran, in the shed below, waved a large key. Storks, fabjus storks, storks, fabjus storks, bottled em all four, was the reply, and Beetle fell on his bosom. Yes, they'm so's to say, like locked up. If you're going to laugh, Beetle, I shall have to kick you. But I must. Beetle was purple with suppressed mirth. You won't do it here, then? He thrust the already limp beetle through the cartship window. It sobered him, for one cannot laugh in a bed of nettles. Then Storky stepped on his prostrate carcass, and McTurk followed, just as Beetle would have risen. So he was upset, and the nettles painted his cheek with the likeness of hideous eruptions. "'Thought that'd cure you,' said Corcoran, with a sniff. Beetle rubbed his face desperately with dock-leaves and said nothing. All desire to laugh had gone from him. They entered the lane. A clamour broke out from the barn, a compound noise of horse-like kicks, shaking door-panels, and five-fold yells. "'They found it out,' said Corcoran. "'How strange!' he sniffed again. "'Let em, said Beetle. "'No one can hear em. "'Come on up to Col. "'What a brute you are, Beetle! "'You only think of your beastly self. "'Those cows will milk him, poor dears. "'Hear em low,' said McTurk. "'Go back and milk em yourself, then,' said Beetle, dancing with pain. "'We shall miss Col over, hanging about like this, "'and I've two black marks this week already.' "'Then you'll have fatigue drill on Monday, sure pop,' said Storky. "'Come to think of it, I've got two black marks, so see. Hmm, this is serious. This is hefty serious.' "'I told you,' said Beetle, with vindictive triumph. "'And we want to go out after that ox's nest on Monday. "'We shall be swatting dumbbells, though. "'All your fault. "'If we'd bunk with De Vitre at first. Storky paused between the hedgerows. "'Hold on a shake and then burble. "'Do you know, I believe someone's shut up in that barn. "'I think we ought to go and see. "'Don't be a giddy idiot. "'Come on back to call. "'But Corcoran took no notice of Beetle. "'He retraced his steps to the head of the lane, "'and, lifting his voice, cried as in bewilderment. "'Hello! Who's there? What's that row about? Who are you?' "'Oh, Peter!' said Beetle, and forgot his pain in this new and jestful development. "'Oi! Oi! You let us out!' The answers came muffled and hollow from the black bulk of the barn, with renewed thunders on the door. "'Now, play up,' said Corcoran. "'Turkey, you keep the cows merry. We've just discovered them. We don't know anything, remember?' Keep your eye on your uncle. They picked their way over the muck, and held speech through the crack by the hinge. Three more genuinely surprised boys the North Devon rain never fell upon. And they were so polite, so polite and so difficult to enlighten, they had to be told again and again. We've been here for hours and hours. That was Tui. And the cows to milk and all. That was Vidley. The door. She blewed against us and jammed herself. That was Abraham. I yes, we can see that. It's quite jammed this side, said Storky. How careless you farmers are. Openin', openin'. Bash her open with a rock, young gentleman. The cows are milk heated and raging. Haven't you boys no sense? Seeing that McTurk from time to time tweaked the wretched cattle into renewed bellowings and caperings, it was quite possible that the boys had some knowledge of a sort. But Mr. Vidley was rude. They told him so through the door, professing only now to recognize his voice. "'Humor on if he can. I paid seven and six for the Don Padlock,' said Tui. "'You remind him. Tis only old Vidley.' "'Be you going to stay a prisoner and captive for the sake of a lock, Tui?' I'm shamed of ye. Rout and open, young gentleman. Twas a God's own mercy you were at us. To ye, you my born miser. 
be a long job, said Corcoran. Look here, it's near our call over. If we stay to help you, we'll miss it. We've come miles out of our way already after you. Tell your master, then, what keeps he? An errand of mercy, like. I'll tell him, too, when we bring the milk to-morrow, said Tui. That's no good, said Corcoran. We may be cane twice over by then. You'll have to give us a letter. McTurk, backed against the barn wall, was firing steadily and accurately into the cattle. Yes, yes, come down to my house. My missus'll write ye a beauty, young gentleman. She makes the bills. I'll give ye such a letter of recommendation as I'd give my own son, if only you can humour the, the dumb lock. Never mind the lock, Vidley wailed. Let me get to my poor dumb cows, for I ain't dead. They went to work with ostentatious rattlings and wrenchings, and a good deal of the by-play that Corcoran always loved. At last the noise of unlocking was covered by some fancy hammering with a young boulder. The door swung open, and the captives marched out. "'Hurry up, Mr. Tui, said Corcoran. "'We ought to be getting back. Will you give us that note, please?' "'Some of you collegers was driving my cattle off the burrowses,' said Vidley. "'I give ye fair warning. I'll tell your masters. "'I know you!' he glared at Corcoran. McTurk looked him over from head to heel with a slow stare. "'Oh, it's only old Vidley, drunk again, I suppose. "'Well, we can't help that. "'Come on, Mr. Tui. "'We'll go to your house.' "'Drunk, am I? I'll drink ye. "'How do I know yo bain't same lot? "'Abram, did he take their names and numbers?' "'What is he raving about?' said Beetle. "'My good fool, can't you see that if we'd taken your beastly cattle "'we shouldn't be hanging around your beastly barns? "'Pon my Sam, you governors haven't any sense.' "'Let alone gratitude,' said Corcoran. I suppose he was drunk, Mr. Tui, and you locked him in the barn to get sober. Shocking, oh, shocking. Bidley denied the charge, in language that the boys' mothers would have wept to hear. Well, go and look after your cows, then, said McTurk. Don't stand here cursing us, because we've been kind enough to help you out of a scrape. Why on earth weren't your cows milked before? You're no farmer. It's long past milking. No wonder they're half crazy. Disreputable old bog trotter, you are. Brush your hair, sir. Beg your pardon, Mr. Tui. I hope we're not keeping you. They left Vidley, dancing on the muck heap amid the cows, and devoted themselves to propitiating Mr. Tui on their way to his house. Exercise had made them hungry, and hunger is the mother of good manners. They won golden opinions from Mrs. Tui. Three quarters of an hour late for callover and fifteen minutes late for lock-up, said Foxy the school sergeant crisply. He was waiting for them at the head of the corridor. Report to your housemaster, please. And a nice mess you're in, young gentleman. Quite right, Foxibus. Strict attention to duty, does it? said Corcoran. Now, where, if we asked you, would you say that his honour, Mr. Prout, might, at this moment of time, be found prouting? In his study as usual, Mr. Corcoran. He took callover. Did he? Hurrah! Lux with us. Don't blub, Foxy. I am afraid you won't catch us this time. We went up to change, sir, before coming to you. That made us a little late, sir. We weren't really very late. We were detained by a... An errand of mercy, said Beetle, and they laid Mrs. Tui's laboriously written note before him. We thought you'd prefer a letter, sir. He got himself locked into a barn, and we heard him shouting. Tui, who brings the coal milk, sir. And we went to let him out. There were ever so many cows waiting to be milked, said McTurk. And, of course, he couldn't get at em, sir. They said the door had jammed. There's the note, sir. Mr. Prout read it over twice. It was perfectly unimpeachable. Only it said nothing but the large tea supplied by Mrs. Tui. Well, I don't like your getting mixed up with farmers and pot Of course, You'll not have any more to do with the Tuies. Of course not, sir. 
"'It was really on account of the cows, sir,' said McTurk, glowing with philanthropy. "'And you came straight back?' "'We ran nearly all the way from the cattle-gate,' said Corcoran, carefully developing the unessential. "'That's a mile, sir. Of course, we had to get the note from Tui first. "'But it was because we went to change, we were rather wet, sir, that we were really late.' After we'd reported ourselves to the sergeant, sir, and he knew we were in coal, we didn't like to come to your study all dirty. Sweeter than honey in the comb was the voice of Beetle. Oh, very good, don't let it happen again. Their housemaster learned to know them better in later years. They entered, not to say swaggered into, a form room, where De Vitre, Orin, Parsons, and Howlett before the fire were still telling their adventures to admiring associates. They rose as one boy. "'What happened to you? We just saved Callover. Did you stay on? Tell us.' The three smiled pensively. They were not distinguished for telling more than was necessary. "'Oh, we stayed on a bit, and then we came away,' said McTurk. "'That's all.' "'You scab, you might tell a chap, anyhow.' "'Think so.' "'Well, that's awfully good of you, De Vitre. "'Pon my sainted Sam, that's awfully good of you,' said Corcoran, "'shouldering into the centre of the warmth "'and toasting one slippered foot before the blaze. "'So you really think we might tell you?' "'They stared at the coals, "'and shook with deep, delicious chuckles. "'My hat! We were stalky,' said McTurk. "'I swear we were about as stalky as they make em, weren't we?' "'It was a fabulous stock," said Beetle. "'Much too good to tell you brutes, though.' The form wriggled under the insult, but made no motion to avenge it. After all, on De Vitre's showing, the three had saved the raiders from a public licking. "'It wasn't half bad,' said Cochrane. "'Stalky is the word.' "'You were the really stalky one,' said McTurk, one contemptuous shoulder turned to the listening world. "'By gum, you were a stalky.' Corcoran accepted the compliment, and the name together. "'Yes,' said he. "'Keep your eye on your Uncle Storky, and he'll pull you through.' "'Well, you needn't gloat so,' said De Vitre viciously. "'You look like a stuffed cat.' Corcoran, henceforth to be known as Storky, took not the faintest notice, but smiled dreamily. "'My hat! Yes, of course,' he murmured. "'Your Uncle Storky. A deuced good name.' "'Your Uncle Storky is no end of a stalker. "'He's a great man, I swear he is. "'De Vitre, you're an ass, a putrid ass.' "'De Vitre would have denied this, "'but for assenting murmurs from Parsons and Orin. "'You needn't rub it in, then.' "'But I do, I does. "'You're such a whopping ass. "'Do you know it?' "'Think over it a bit at prep. "'Think it up in bed.' Just oblige me by thinking of it every half-hour till further notice. Gummy! What an ass you are! But your Uncle Storky, he picked up the form-room poker, and drove it thoughtfully against the mantelpiece, is a great man. Hear, hear! said Beetle and McTurk, who had fought under that general. Isn't your Uncle Storky a great man, De Vitre? Speak the truth, you fat-headed old impostor. Yes, said De Vitre, deserted by his band. I, I suppose he is. Mustn't suppose. Don't guess. Well, he is. A great man? A great man. Now won't you tell us? said De Vitre, pleadingly. Not by a heap, said Storky Corcoran. Therefore the tale has stayed untold until today. Editor's Note this is the first of a series of stories that Mr. Kipling has written about Storky, Beetle, McTurk, and their associates. The second, entitled An Unsavoury Interlude, will appear in the January number. End of chapter one. Record. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Regulus by Rudyard Kipling Regulus, a Roman general, defeated the Carthaginians 256 BC, but was next year defeated and taken prisoner by the Carthaginians, who sent him to Rome with an embassy to ask for peace, 
or an exchange of prisoners. Regulus strongly advised the Roman Senate to make no terms with the enemy. He then returned to Carthage and was put to death. The fifth form had been dragged several times in its collective life from one end of the school Horace to the other. Those were the years when army examiners gave thousands of marks for Latin, and it was Mr. King's hated business to defeat them. Hear him then on a raw November morning at second lesson. Aha! he began rubbing his hands. Crass ingens iter abimus aequor. Our portion today is the fifth ode of the third book, I believe, concerning one Regulus, a gentleman. How often have we been through it? Twice, sir, said Malpas, the head of the form. Mr. King shuddered. Yes, twice, quite literally, he said. Today, with an eye to your army viva voce examinations, ugh, I shall exact somewhat freer and more florid renditions, with feeling and comprehension, if that be possible. I accept, here his eye swept the back benches, our friend and companion, Beetle, from whom, now as always, I demand an absolutely literal translation. The form laughed subserviently. Spare his blushes. Beetle charms us first. Beetle stood up, confident in the possession of a guaranteed construe, left behind by McTurk, who had that day gone to the sick house with a cold. Yet he was too wary a hand to show confidence. Credidimus, we believe, we have believed, he opened in hesitating slow time. Tonantem Joven, thundering Jove, Regnari, to reign, Kylo, heaven, in, in heaven, Augustus, Augustus, Habebitur, will be held or considered, Price ends Divus, a present god, Adjectis Britannis, the Britons being added, Imperio to the Empire. Gravibusque Persis, with the heavy uh, stern Persians. What? The grave or stern Persians. Beetle pulled up with the thank God I have done my duty, sir, air of Nelson in the cockpit. I am quite aware, said King, that the first stanza is about the extent of your knowledge, but continue, sweet one, continue. Gravibus, by the way, is usually translated as troublesome. Beetle drew a long and tortured breath. The second stanza, which carries over to the third of that ode, is what is technically called a stinker. But the Turk had done him handsomely. Milesne Crassi had has the soldier of Crassus, Vixit lived, Turpis Maritus, a disgraceful husband. You slurred the quantity of the word after Turpis, said King. Let's hear it. Beetle guessed again, and for a wonder hit the correct quantity. Uh, a disgraceful husband, a conjuge Barbara, with a barbarous spouse. Why did you select that disgustful equivalent out of all the dictionary? King snapped. Isn't wife good enough for you? Yes, sir. But what do I do about this bracket, sir? Shall I take it now? Confine yourself at present to the soldier of Crassus. Yes, sir. Et and consenuit has he grown old in armies in the uh, arms hositum soccerorum of his father-in-law's enemies. Who, how, which? Arms of his enemy's father's-in-law, sir. Thanks. By the way, what meaning do you attach to in armies? Oh, weapons, weapons of war, sir. There was a virginal note in Beetle's voice, as though he had been falsely accused of uttering indecencies. Shall I take the bracket now, sir? Since it seems to be troubling you. Procuria. Oh, for the Senate House. Inversique mores, and manners upset, upside down. Very like your translation. Meantime, the soldier of Crassus, sub rege medo, under a Median king, 
Marsus et Apulus, being a Martian and an Apulian. Who, the Median king? No, sir, the soldier Crassus. Oblitus agrees with Melisne Crassi, sir, volunteered to Hasty Beetle. Does it? It doesn't with me. Oh, Blitus, Beetle corrected hastily. Forgetful, and Ciliorum of the shields, or trophies, et nominis, and the his name, et togae, and the toga, eternaeque vestae, and eternal vesta. In columni Jove, Jove being safe, et urbe Roma, and the Roman city, with an air of hardly restrained zeal. Shall I go on, sir? Mr. King winced. No, thank you. You have indeed given us a translation. May I ask if it conveys any meaning whatever to your so-called mind? Oh, I think so, sir. This with a gentle toleration for Horace and all his works. We envy you. Sit down. Beetle sat down, relieved, well knowing that a reef of uncharted genitives stretched ahead of him, on which, in spite of McTurk's sailing directions, he would infallibly have been wrecked. Rattray, who took up the task, steered neatly through them, and came unscathed to port. "'Here we require drama,' said King. "'Regulus himself is speaking now. "'Who shall represent the provident-minded Regulus? "'Winton, will you kindly oblige?' Winton of King's House, a long, heavy, tow-headed, second fifteen forward, overdue for his first fifteen colours, and in aspect like an earnest elderly horse, rose up and announced, among other things, that he had seen signs affixed to Punic deluges, half the form shouted for joy, and the other half for joy that there was something to shout about. Mr. King opened and shut his eyes with great swiftness. Signa had fixer de lubris, he gasped. So de lubris is deluges, is it, Winton? In all our dealings have I ever suspected you of a jest? No, sir said a rigid and angular Winton, while the form rocked about him. And yet you assert delubris means deluges. Whether I am a fit subject for such a jape is, of course, a matter of opinion. But, Winton, you are normally conscientious. May we assume you looked out delubris? No, sir. Winton was privileged to speak that truth dangerous to all who stand before kings made a shot at it then. Every line of Winton's body showed that it had done nothing of the sort. Indeed, the very idea that Pater Winton, and a boy is not called Pater by companions for his frivolity, would make a shot at anything was beyond belief. But he replied, yes, and all the while worked with his right heel, as though he were healing a ball at Puntabout. Though none dared boast of being a favourite with the king, the taciturn three-cornered Winton stood high in his housemaster's opinion. It seemed to save him neither rebuke nor punishment, but the two were in some fashion sympathetic. Hm, said King dryly. I was going to say, Flagitto aditis uh, damnum. But I think, uh, I think I see the process. Beetle, the translation of De Lubris, please. Beetle raised his head from his shaking arm long enough to answer, Ruin, sir. There was an impressive pause, while King checked off crimes on his fingers. Then to Beetle the much-enduring man addressed his winged words. Guessing, said he, guessing, Beetle, as usual, from the look of delubris, that it bore some relation to diluvium or deluge, you imparted the result of your half-baked lucubrations to Winton, who seemed to have been lost enough to have accepted it. Observing next your companion's fall, from the presumed security of your undistinguished position in the rear-guard, you took another pot-shot. The turbid chaos of your mind threw up some memory of the word dilapidations, which you have pitifully attempted to disguise under the synonym of ruins. As this was precisely what Beetle had done, he looked hurt but forgiving. "'We will attend to this later,' said King. "'Go on, Winton, and retrieve yourself.' 
delubris happened to be the one word which Winton had not looked out but had asked Beetle for when they were settling into their places he forged ahead with no further trouble only when he rendered Skiliset as forsooth King erupted Regulus he said was not a leader writer for the penny press nor for that matter was Horace Regulus says the soldier ransomed by gold will become keener for the fight will he by gum that's the meaning of Silicet. It indicates contempt, bitter contempt. Forsooth, forsooth. You'll be talking about speckled beauties and eventually transpire next. Howell, what do you make of that doubled vidi ego ego vidi? It wasn't put in to fill up the meter, you know. Isn't it intensive, sir? said Howell, afflicted by a genuine interest in what he read. Regulus was a bit in earnest about Rome making no terms with Carthage, and he wanted to let the Romans understand it, didn't he, sir? Less than your usual grace, but the fact. Regulus was in earnest. He was also engaged at the same time in cutting his own throat with every word he uttered. He knew Carthage, which, your examiners won't ask you this, so you needn't take notes, was a sort of godforsaken nigger Manchester. Regulus was not thinking about his own life. He was telling Rome the truth. He was playing for his side. Those lines from the eighteenth to the fortieth ought to be written in blood. Yet there are things in human garments which will tell you that Horace was a flaneur, a man about town. Avoid such beings. Horace knew a great deal. He knew. Erit ille fortis. Will he be brave, who once to faithless foes has knelt? And again, stop pouring with your hooves, Thornton. Hic unde vitam sumeret inscius. That means roughly, but I perceive I'm ahead of my translators. Begin at hic unde, Vernon, and let us see if you have the spirit of Regulus. Now, no one expected fireworks from gentle Paddy Vernon, sub-prefect of Hartrop's house. But, as must often be the case with growing boys, his mind was in abeyance for the time being. And he said, all in a rush, on behalf of Regulus, O magna Carthago, pro proposis, altior Italae ruinis, O Carthage, thou wilt stand forth higher than the ruins of Italy. Even Beetle, most lenient of critics, was interested at this point, though he did not join the half groan of reprobation from the wiser heads of the form. Please don't mind me, said King, and Vernon kindly did not. He ploughed on thus. He Regulus is related to have removed from himself the kiss of the shameful wife and of his small children as less by the head, and, being stern, to have placed his virile visage on the ground. Since King loved virile about as much as he did spouse or forsooth, the form looked up hopefully. But Jove thundered not. Until, Vernon continued, he should have confirmed the sliding fathers as being the author of counsel never given under an alias. He stopped, conscious of the stillness around him, like the dead calm of the typhoon's centre. King's opening voice was sweeter than honey. I am painfully aware by bitter experience that I cannot give you any idea of the passion, the power, the the essential guts of the lines which you have so foully outraged in our presence. But, the note changed, in so far as in me lies, I will strive to bring home to you, Vernon, the fact that there exist in Latin a few pitiful rules of grammar, of syntax, nay, even of declension, which were not created for your incult sport your Boeotian diversion. You will therefore, Vernon, write out and bring to me to-morrow a word-for-word -word English Latin translation of the Ode, together with a full list of all adjectives. An adjective is not a verb, Vernon, as the lower third will tell you. All adjectives, their number, case, and gender. Even now I haven't begun to deal with you faithfully. I, I am very sorry, sir, Vernon stammered. You mistake the symptoms, Vernon. You are possibly discomfited by the imposition. 
but sorrow postulates some sort of mind intellect noose your rendering of probrosis alone stamps you lower than the beasts of the field will someone take the taste out of our mouths and talking of tastes <coughs> he coughed there was a distinct flavour of chlorine gas in the air up went an eyebrow though king knew perfectly well what it meant mr hart drops science class next door said malpas oh yes i had forgotten our newly established modern side of course perron open the windows and winton go on once more from interque myrentes and hastened away said winton surrounded by his morning friends into into illustrious banishment but i got that out of conington sir he added in one conscientious breath i am aware the master generally knows his ass's crib though i acquit you of any intention that way can you suggest anything for egregious exile only egregious exile i fear egregious is a good word ruined no you can't in this case improve on conington now then for atqui scibat quae sibi barbarus torto pararet the whole force of this lies in the atqui although he knew winton suggested stronger than that i think he who knew well malpas interpolated yes well though he knew i don't like conington's well witting it's wardour street well though he knew what the savage torturer was was getting ready for him said winton yes had in store for him yet he brushed aside his kinsmen and the people delaying his return yes but how do you render obstantes if it's a free translation mightn't obstantes and mortantem come to about the same thing sir nothing comes to about the same thing with horace winton as i have said horace was not a journalist now i take it that his kinsman bodily withstood his departure whereas the crowd populumque the, the democracy stood about futilely pitying him and getting in the way now for that noblest of endings quam si clientum and king ran off into the quotation as though some tedious business or of clients court his journey lay towards venafrum's grassy floor or sparta built tarentum's bay all right winton beetle when you've quite finished dodging the fresh air yonder give me the meaning of tendens and turn down your collar me sir tendin sir oh stretching away in the direction of sir idiot regulus was not a feature of the landscape he was a man self-doomed to death by torture at qui scabat knowing it having achieved it for his country's sake can't you hear that at qui cut like a knife he moved off with some dignity that's why horace out of the whole golden latin tongue chose the one word tendens which is utterly untranslatable the gross injustice of being asked to translate it converted beetle into a young christian martyr till king buried his nose in his handkerchief again i think they've broken another gas bottle next door sir said howell they're always doing it the form coughed as more chlorine came in well i suppose you must be patient with the modern side said king but it's most insupportable for this side vernon what are you grinning at vernon's mind had returned to him glowing and inspired he chuckled as he underlined his horace it appears to amuse you said king let us participate what is it the last two lines of the tenth ode in this book sir was vernon's amazing reply what oh i see non hoc semper erit liminis out aeque silestis patens latus king's mouth twitched to hide a grin was that done with intention this side will not always be patient of rain and waiting on the household i, I thought it fitted sir it does it's distinctly happy what put it into your thick head paddy i don't know sir except we did the ode last term and you remembered the same head that minted proposis as a verb vernon you are an enigma no this side will not always be patient of unheavenly gases and waters i will make representations to our so-called moderns 
Meantime, who shall say that I am not just? I remit you your accrued pains and penalties in regard to probosium, probosis, probosit, and other enormities. I oughtn't to do it, but this side is occasionally human. By no means bad, Paddy. Thank you, sir, said Vernon, wondering how inspiration had visited him. Then King, with a few brisk remarks about science, headed them back to Regulus, of whom, and of Horace, and Rome, and evil-minded commercial Carthage, and of the democracy eternally futile, he explained, in all ages and climes, he spoke for ten minutes, passing thence to the next ode, Delicta Majorum, where he fetched up full-voiced upon Diste minorem quod geris imperas. Thou rulest because thou bearest thyself as lower than the gods, making it a text for a discourse on manners, morals, and respect for authority, as distinct from bottled gases, which lasted till the bell rang. Then Beetle, concertinering his books, observed to Winton, When King's really on tap, he's an interesting dog. Hartop's chlorine uncorked him. Yes, but why did you tell me Delubris was deluges, you silly ass? said Winton. Well, that uncocked him, too. Look out, you hoof-handled old owl! Winton had cleared for action, as the form poured out like puppies at play, and was scragging Beetle. Storky, from behind, followed Winton low. The three fell in confusion. Diste minorem quod geris imperas, quoth Storky, ruffling Winton's lint-white locks. Mustn't jape the number five, study. Don't be too virtuous, don't brood over it. Don't count against you in your future career. Cheer up, Peter. Pile him off my er, essential guts, will you? said Beetle from underneath. He's squashing em. They dispersed to their studies. No one, the owner least of all, can explain what is in a growing boy's mind. It might have been the blind ferment of adolescence. Storky's random remarks about virtue might have stirred him. Like his betters, he might have sought popularity by way of clowning, or, as the head asserted years later, the only known jest of his serious life might have worked on him, as a sober-sided man's one love, colours and dislocates all his after days. But at the next lesson, mechanical drawing with Mr. Lidget, who as drawing-master had very limited powers of punishment, Winton fell suddenly from grace and let loose a live mouse in the form-room, the whole form shrieking and leaping high, threw at it all the plaster cones, pyramids, and fruit in high relief, not to mention ink-pots that, that they could lay hands on. Mr. Lidget reported at once to the head. Winton owned up to his crime, which venial in the upper third, pardonable at a price in the lower fourth, was, of course, rank ruffianism on the part of a fifth-form boy, and so by graduated stages he arrived at the head's study just before lunch, penitent, perturbed, annoyed with himself, and, as the head said to King in the corridor after the meal, more human than he had known him in seven years. You see, the head drawled on, Winton's only fault is a certain costive and unaccommodating virtue. So this comes very happily. I never noticed any sign of it, said King. Winton was in King's house and though King, as proconsul, might and did infernally impress his own province, once a black and yellow cap was in trouble at the hands of the imperial authority, King fought for him, to the very last steps of Caesar's throne. "'Well, you yourself admitted just now that the mouse was beneath the occasion,' the head answered. "'It was,' said King. Mr. King did not love Mr. Lidget. "'It should have been a rat.' But, but, I hate to plead it, it's the lad's first offence. Could you have damned him more completely, King? Hmm, what's the penalty? said King in retreat, but keeping up a rearguard action. Only my usual few lines of Virgil be shown up by tea-time. The head's eyes turned slightly to the end of the corridor where Mullins, captain of the games, Pot, old Pot, or Potiphar Mullins, was pinning up the usual Wednesday notice. Big, middle, and little side football, A to K, L to Z, 3 to 4.45 p.m. 
you cannot write out the head's usual few which means five hundred latin lines and play football for more than one and three quarters for more than one hour and three quarters between the hours of one thirty and five p m winton had evidently no intention of trying to do so for he hung about the corridor with a set face and an uneasy foot yet it was law in the school compared to which that of the medes and persians was no more than non-committal resolution that any boy outside the first fifteen who missed his football for any reason whatever and had not a written excuse duly signed by competent authority to explain his absence would receive not less than three strokes with a ground ash from the captain of the games generally a youth between seventeen and eighteen years rarely under seven stone pot was nearer thirteen and always in hard condition king knew without inquiry that the head had given winton no such excuse but he's practically a member of the first fifteen he's played for it all this term said king i believe his cap should have arrived next week his cap has not been given him oddly therefore he is naught i rely on old pot but mullins is winton's study mate king persisted pot mullins and pater winton were cousins and rather close friends that will make no difference to mullins or winton if i know em said the head but but king played his last card desperately i was going to recommend winton for extra sub prefect in my house now carton has gone certainly said the head why not he will be excellent by tea-time i hope at that moment he saw mr lidgett tripping down the corridor waylaid by winton it's about that mouse business at mechanical drawing winton opened swinging across his path yes yes highly disgraceful mr lidgett panted i know it was said winton it, it was a cad's trick because because you knew i couldn't give you more than fifty lines said mr lidgett well anyhow i've come to apologize for it certainly said mr lidgett and added for he was a kindly man i think that shows quite right feeling i'll tell the head at once i'm satisfied no no the boy's still unmended voice jumped from the growl to the squeak i didn't mean that i did it on principle please don't do anything of that kind Mr. Lidgett looked him up and down, and, being an artist, understood. "'Thank you, Winton,' he said. "'This shall be between ourselves.' "'You heard?' said King, in decent pride in his voice. "'Of course. You thought he was going to get Lidgett to beg him off the impot.' King denied this with so much warmth that the head laughed, and King went away in a huff. "'By the way,' said the head, I've told Winton to do his lines in your form room, not his study. Thanks, said King over his shoulder, for the head's orders had saved Winton and Mullins, who was doing extra army work in the study, from an embarrassing afternoon together. An hour later, King wandered into his form room as though by accident. Winton was hard at work. Aha, said King, rubbing his hands. This does not look like games, Winton. Don't let me arrest your facile pen. Whence this sudden love for Virgil? Impo from the head, sir, for that mouse business this morning. Rumours thereof have reached us. That was a lapse on your part into lower thirdary which I don't quite understand. The tump-tump of the puntabouts before the sides settled to games came through the open window. Winton, like his housemaster, loved fresh air. When they heard Paddy Vernon, sub-prefect on duty, calling the roll in the field and marking defaulters, Winton wrote steadily. King curled himself up on a desk, hands round knees. One would have said that the man was gloating over the boy's misfortune, but the boy understood. Diste minorem quod geris imperas, quoted King presently. It is necessary to bear oneself as lower than the local gods, even then drawing masters who are precluded from effective retaliation. I do wish you'd tried that mouse game with me, Pater. Winton grinned, then sobered. It was a cad's trick, sir, to play on Mr. Lidgett. He peered forward at the page he was copying. Well, the sin I impute to each frustrate ghost. King stopped himself. Why do you goggle like an owl? Hand me the mantuan and I'll dictate. No matter. 
any rich virgilian measures will serve i may peradventure recall a few he began te regere imperio populos romane memento hae tibi erunt artes pacisque imponerum morem pacere subjectis et debellare superbos there you have it all winton write that out twice and yet once again for the next forty minutes with never a glance at the book king paid out the glorious hexameters and king could read latin as though it were alive winton hauling them in and coiling them away behind him as trimmers in a telegraph ship's hold coil away deep-sea cable king broke from the Iliad for the georgics and back again pausing now and then to translate some specially loved line or to dwell on the treble shot texture of the ancient fabric he did not allude to the coming interview with mullins except at the last when he said i think at this juncture pater i need not ask you for the precise significance of at quis quiebat quae sibi barbarus tortor the ungrateful winton flushed angrily and king loafed out to take five o'clock call over after which he invited little hartop to tea and a talk on chlorine gas hartop accepted the challenge like a bantam and the two went up to king's study about the same time as winton returned to the form room beneath it to finish his lines then half a dozen of the second fifteen who should have been washing strolled in to condole with pater winton whose misfortune and its consequences were common talk no one was more sincere than the long red-headed knotty-knuckled paddy vernon but being a careless animal he joggled winton's desk curse you for a silly ass said winton don't do that no one is expected to be polite while under punishment so vernon sinking his sub-prefectship replied peacefully enough well don't be wrathy pater i'm not said winton get out this ain't your house form room form room don't belong to you why don't you go to your own study vernon replied because mullins is there waiting for the victim said stalky delicately and they all laughed you ought to have shaken that mouse out of your trouser leg pater that's the way i did in my youth pater's reverting to his second childhood never mind pater we all respect you and your future career winton still writhing growled vernon leaning on the desk somehow shook it again then he laughed what are you grinning at winton asked i was only thinking of you being sent up to take a licking from pot i swear i don't think it's fair you've never shirked a game in your life and you're as good as in the first fifteen already your cap ought to have been delivered last week oughtn't it it was law in the school that no man could by any means enjoy the privileges and immunities of the first fifteen till the black velvet cap with the gold tassel made by dilatory exeter outfitters had been actually set on his head ages ago a large built and unruly second fifteen had attempted to change this law but the prefects of that age were still larger and the lively experiment had never been repeated will you said winton very slowly kindly mind your own damned business you cursed clumsy fat-headed fool the form room was as silent as the empty field in the darkness outside vernon shifted his feet uneasily well i shouldn't like to take a lick in from pot he said wouldn't you winton asked as he paged the sheets of lines with hands that shook no i shouldn't said vernon his freckles growing more distinct on the bridge of his white nose well i'm going to take it winton moved clear of the desk as he spoke but you're going to take a licking from me first and before anyone realized it he'd flung himself neighing against vernon no decencies were observed on either side and the rest looked on amazed the two met confusedly vernon trying to do what he could with his longer reach winton insensible to blows only concerned to drive his enemy into a corner and batter him to pulp this he managed over against the fireplace where vernon dropped half stunned now i'm going to give you your lickin said winton lie there till i get a ground ash and i'll cut you to pieces if you move i'll chuck you out of the window 
he wound his hands into the boy's collar and waistband and had actually heaved him half off the ground before the others with one accord dropped on his head shoulders and legs he fought them crazily in an awful hissing silence Storky's sensitive nose was rubbed along the floor beetle received a jolt in the wind that sent him whistling and crowing against the wall Perone's forehead was cut and Malpas came up with an eye that explained itself like a dying rainbow through a whole week mad quite mad said Storky and for the third time wriggled back to Winton's throat the door opened and King came in Hartop's little figure just behind him the mound on the floor panted and heaved but did not rise for Winton still squirmed vengefully only a little play sir said Perone only hit my head against a form this was quite true oh said King de movid obstantes propinquos you I presume are the populace delaying Winton's return to Mullins eh no sir said Storky behind his claret-coloured handkerchief we're the Mayorentes amicos not bad you see some of it sticks after all King chuckled to Hartop and the two masters left without further inquiries the boys sat still on the now passive Winton well said Storky at last of all the putrid he asses Pater you are the I'm sorry I'm awfully sorry Winton began and they let him rise he held out his hand to the bruised and bewildered Vernon sorry Paddy I, I must have lost my temper I don't know what's the matter with me fat lot of good that'll do my face at tea Vernon grunted why couldn't you say there was something wrong with you instead of damning out like a lunatic is my lip puffy just a trifle look at my beak well we got all those pretty marks at footer owing to the zeal with which we played the game said Storky dusting himself but do you think you're fit to be let loose again pater sure you don't want to kill another sub prefect I wish I was pot I'd cut your sprightly young soul out I suppose I ought to go to pot now said Winton and let all the other asses see you looking like this not much we'll all come up to number five study and wash off in hot water beetle you aren't damaged go along and light the gas stove there's a tin of cocoa in my study somewhere Perone shouted after him root around till you find it and take it up separately by different roads Vernon's jersey pulled half over his head the boys repaired to number five study little Hartop and King I'm sorry to say leaned over the banisters of King's Landing and watched very human said little Hartop your virtuous Winton having got himself into trouble takes it out of my poor old Paddy I wonder what precise lie Paddy will tell about his face but surely you aren't going to embarrass him by asking said King your boy won said Hartop to go back to what we were discussing said King quickly do you pretend that your modern system of inculcating unrelated facts about chlorine for instance all of which have been proved fallacies by the time the boys grow up can have any real bearing on education even the low type of it that the examiners expect I maintain nothing but is it any worse than your Chinese reiteration of uncomprehended syllables in a dead tongue dead forsooth King Felly danced the only living tongue on earth Chinese my word Hartop and the end of seven years how often have I said it Hartop went on seven years of two hundred and twenty days of six hours each your victims go away with nothing absolutely nothing except perhaps if they've been very attentive a dozen no I'll grant you twenty one score of totally unrelated Latin tags which any child of twelve could have absorbed in two terms but but can't you realize that if our system brings later at any rate at a pinch a simple understanding grammar and latinity apart a mere glimpse of the significance foul word of we'll say one ode of Horace one twenty lines of Virgil we've got what we poor devils of ushers are striving after and what might that be said Hartop balance proportion perspective life your scientific man is the unrelated animal the beast without background have you ever realized that 
in your atmosphere of stinks meanwhile you should make them lose life for the sake of living eh blind again hartop i told you about paddy's quotation this morning he made proposis a verb he did you yourself heard young cochran's reference to my rentes amicos it sticks a little of it sticks among the barbarians absolutely and essentially chinese said little hartop who alone in the common room refused to be outfaced by king but i don't understand how paddy came to be licked by winton paddy's supposed to be something of a boxer beware of vinegar made from honey king replied pater like some other people is patient and long-suffering but he has his limits the head is oppressing him damnably too as i pointed out the boy has practically been in the first fifteen since the term began but my dear fellow i have known you give a boy an impo and refuse him leave off games again and again ah but that was when there was real need to get at some oaf who couldn't be sensitized any other way now in our esteemed heads action i see nothing but for the conversation from this point does not concern us meanwhile winton very penitent and especially polite towards vernon was being cheered with cocoa in number five study they had some difficulty in stemming the flood of his apologies he himself pointed out to vernon that he had attacked a sub-prefect for no reason whatever and therefore deserved official punishment i can't think what was the matter with me to-day he mourned ever since that blasted mouse business well then don't think said stalky or do you want paddy to make a row about it before all the school here vernon was understood to say that he could see winton and all the school somewhere else and if you imagine perone and malpas and me are going to give evidence at a prefect's meeting just to soothe your beastly conscience you jolly well err said beetle i know what you did what croaked peter out of the valley of his humiliation you went berserk i've read all about it in hypatia what's going berserk winton asked never you mind was the reply now don't you feel awfully weak and seedy i am rather tired said winton sighing that's what you ought to be you've gone berserk and pretty soon you'll go to sleep but you'll probably be liable to fits of it all your life beetle concluded shouldn't wonder if you murdered someone some day shut up you and your berserks said stalky go to mullins now and get it over pater call it filthy unjust of the head said vernon anyhow you've given me my licking old man i hope pot'll give you yours i'm awfully awfully sorry was winton's last word it was the custom in that consulship to deal with games defaulters between five o'clock call over and tea mullins who was old enough to pity did not believe in letting boys wait through the night till the chill of the next morning for their punishments he was finishing off the last of the small fry and their excuses when winton arrived but please mullins this was babcock tertius a dear little twelve-year-old mother's darling i had an awful hack on the knee i've been to matron about it and she gave me some iodine i've been rubbing it in all day i thought that would be an excuse off let's have a look at it said the impassive mullins that's a shin bruise about a week old touch your toes i'll give you the iodine babcock yelled loudly as he had many times before the face of jevons aged eleven a new boy that dark wet term low in the house low in the lower school and lowest of all in his homesick little mind turned white at the horror of the sight they could hear his working lips part stickily as babcock wailed his way out of the hearing hello jevons what brings you here said mullins P please sir i went for a walk with babcock tertius did you then i bet you went to the tuck shop and you paid didn't you a nod jevons was too terrified to speak of course and i bet babcock told you that old pot had let you off because it was the first time another nod with a ghost of a smile in it all right mullins picked jevons up before he could guess what was coming laid him on the table with one hand with the other gave him three empathetic spanks then held him high in the air now you tell babcock tertius that he's got you a licking from me and see you jolly well pay it back to him 
when you're prefect of games don't you let anyone shirk his footer without a written excuse where do you play your game forward sir you can do better than that i've seen you run like a young buck rabbit ask dixon from me to try you out as three quarters next game will you cut along jevons left warm for the first time that day enormously set up in his own esteem and very hot against the deceitful babcock mullins turned to winton your name's on the list pater winton nodded i know it the head landed me with an impo for that mouse business at mechanical drawing no excuse he meant it then mullins jerked his head delicately towards the ground ash shot on the table i heard something about it winton nodded rotten thing to do he said i can't think what i was doing ever to do it it counts against a fellow so and there's some more too all right pater just stand clear of our photo bracket will you the little formality over there was a pause winton swung round yawned in pot's astonished face and staggered towards the window seat what's the matter with you dick ill no perfectly all right thanks only only a little sleepy winton stretched himself out and then and there fell deeply and placidly asleep it isn't a faint said the experienced mullins or his pulse wouldn't act it isn't a fit or it's snort and twitch it can't be sunstroke this term and he hasn't been overtraining for anything he opened winton's collar packed a cushion under his head threw a rug over him and sat down to listen to the regular breathing before long stalky arrived on pretence of borrowing a book he looked at the window seat notice anything wrong with winton lately said mullins notice anything wrong with my beak stalky replied pater went berserk after callover and fell on a lot of us for jesting with him about his impo you ought to see malpass's eye you mean pater fought said mullins like a devil and then he nearly went to sleep in our study just now i expect he'll be all right when he wakes up rummy business conscientious old bargee you ought to have heard his apologies but pater can't fight one little bit mullins repeated it wasn't fighting he just tried to murder everyone stalky described the affair and when he had left mullins went off to take counsel with the head who out of a cloud of blue smoke told him that all would yet be well winton said he is a little stiff in his moral joints he'll get over that if he asks you whether today's doings will count against him in his but you know it's important to him sir his people aren't very well off said mullins that's why i'm taking all this trouble you must reassure him pot i have overcrowded him with new experiences oh by the way has his cap come it came at dinner sir mullins laughed sure enough when he waked at tea-time Wynne proposed to take mullins all through every one of his day's lapses from grace and do you think it will count against me said he don't you fuss so much about yourself and your silly career said mullins you're all right and oh here's your first cap at last shove it up on the bracket and come on to tea they met king on their way stepping statelily and rubbing his hands i have applied said he for the services of an additional sub-prefect in carton's unlamented absence your name winton seems to have found favour with the powers that be and all things considered i am disposed to give my support to the nomination you are therefore a quasi lector then it didn't count against me winton gasped as soon as they were out of hearing a captain of games can jest with a sub-prefect publicly you utter ass said mullins and caught him on the back of his stiff neck and ran him down to the hall where the sub-prefects who sit below the salt made him welcome with the economical bloater paste of mid-term king and little hartop were sparring in the reverend john gillett's study at ten p m classical versus modern as usual character proportion background snarled king that is the essence of the humanities analects of confucius little hartop answered time said the reverend john behind the soda water you men oppress me hartop what did you say to paddy in your dormitories tonight even you couldn't have overlooked his face but i did said hartop calmly 
I wasn't even humorous about it as some clerics might have been. I went straight through and said naught. Poor Paddy! Now, for my part, said King, you know I'm not lavish with my praises. I consider Winton a first-class type, absolutely first-class. Hardly, said the Reverend John. First class of the second class, I admit. The very best type of second class. But, he shook his head, should have been a rat. Peter will never be anything more than a colonel of engineers. What do you base that verdict on? said King stiffly. He came to me after prayers with all his conscience. Poor old Pater. Was it the mouse? said little Hartop. That, and what he called his uncontrollable temper, and his responsibilities as sub-prefect. And you? If we had had what is vulgarly called a pie-jaw, he'd have had hysterics. So I recommended a dose of Epsom salts. He'll take it, too, conscientiously. Don't eat me, King. Perhaps he'll be a KCB. Ten o'clock struck, and the army class boys, in the further studies, coming to their houses after an extra hour's work, passed along the gravel path below. Someone was chanting to the tune of White Sand and Grey Sand, Diste minorem quod geris imperas. He stopped outside Mullins' study. They heard Mullins' window slide up, and then Storky's voice. Ah, good evening, Mullins, my barbarous tortor. We are the waits. We have come to inquire after the local berserk. Is he doing as well as can be expected in his new career? Better than you will in a sack, Storky, Mullins grunted. Glad of that. We thought he'd like to know that Paddy has been carried to the sick house in raving delirium. They think it's concussion of the brain. Why, he was all right at prayers, Winton began earnestly, and they heard a laugh in the background as Mullins slammed down the window. Night, Regulus, Storky sang out, and the light footsteps went on. You see, it sticks. A little of it sticks among the barbarians, said King. Amen, said the Reverend John. Go to bed. A Translation Horace, Book Five, Ode Three There are those whose study is of smells, and two attentive schools rehearse how something mixed with something else makes something worse. Some cultivate in broths impure the clients of our body, these increasingly without Venus cure or cause disease. Others the heated wheel extol and all its offspring whose concern is how to make it farthest roll and fastest turn me much incurious if the hour present or to be paid for brings me to brindusium by the power of wheels or wings me in whose breasts no flame hath burned life long save that by pindar lit such law leaves cold i am not turned aside to it more than when sunk in thought profound of what the unaltering gods require my steward friend but slave brings round logs for my fire end of regulus